In nearly five years of doing Philosophy Tube, I have never once mentioned the trolley problem until today. Part 1. 99 problems, but a trolley ain't one. Self-driving cars. Apparently, they're gonna be big. The cars themselves will probably be of all different sizes, but as a phenomenon, they are gonna be huge. huge. And so are the ethical implications. In researching this episode, I read a lot of articles about the ethics of self-driving cars. Or rather, I read one article about the ethics of self-driving cars, which seems to have been written about a dozen different times by different people all across the internet. And that article talks about self-driving cars and the trolley problem. The trolley problem, if you haven't heard of it, is a staple of undergraduate philosophy courses. We're going to talk about it, and later on we're going to critique it. First though, for those who haven't heard of it, let me bring you up to speed. You are standing next to a track along which runs trolleys, or trams, and there is a trolley coming along out of control. You look down the track and you see that it is going to hit and kill five people. However, you are standing next to the switch that will cause it to change track. And if you so choose, you can hit that switch and save those five people. But on the other track, there is one person who will be hit and killed. Ah, what do? If you leave it, then five people will die. If you change it, then only one person dies, but you have chosen to deliberately kill that person rather than let some people die. Is it better to save the many, or to obey the rule that you shouldn't deliberately kill people? Is there a moral difference between killing and letting die? Or is there some third option or decision-making process? These are the questions that the trolley problem is supposed to provoke. And there are millions of different versions. Sometimes the one person is also terminally ill, sometimes the five people are all violent criminals, or they're old, or they're young, or they're Nazis, or whatever. That's when the trolley problem becomes trolley problems. Part 2. Too fast? Too curious. If you're very clever, you'll already have seen how this is relevant to self-driving cars. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, in real life there are no-win scenarios like the trolley problem, and human drivers, when they encounter them, just have to make a split-second decision. But because a self-driving car has to be programmed ahead of time, something like an answer to something like the trolley problem needs to be arrived at by programmers before the no-win scenario even comes up. So here's the first challenge. Imagine that we're programming a self-driving car together. We're the philosophy and ethics team that's been brought in to consult the manufacturers. And we've got two options. Do we tell the computer to behave as a human driver would? There's a picture of a human driver. Or do we tell it to behave as we think a human driver should? You might prefer the second option. After all, we already want self-driving cars to be more efficient and safer than a human driver. Why not also more moral than a human driver? But that's tough, because that means that we need to actually sit down and solve the trolley problem. So the other option is that we tell the computer, just do whatever a human being would do. We take a bunch of drivers, we put them in simulations of accidents and no-win scenarios, we record what they do, and we tell the computer, just, just do that. That way, the computer should at least be no more evil behind the wheel than a human would be, presumably. That may not actually be what people want, though. According to psychologist Daniel Kahneman, people prefer a negative outcome to be the result of a human making a bad decision, rather than a negative outcome of the same value to be the result of a computer just making a statistically bad call. We prefer having someone to blame, even if that means we'll be blaming them more often. For instance, in certain circumstances, medical diagnostic algorithms can be more accurate than GPs, but even when told that, patients tend to prefer a human doctor to do their diagnosis, because if they get it wrong, there's someone to blame, and it feels like something can be done. If the computer gets it wrong, then it's just a brute fact that 0.2% of the time or whatever it farts out the wrong answer, and there's nothing you can do, which isn't as comforting. There might be some other problems with asking autonomous vehicles to imitate human behaviour too. Can our practical, ethical decision-making principles be expressed as the kind of hard and fast rules that a computer requires? The philosopher Herbert Dreyfus thinks that they can't, and that's why I said that computers would presumably be no more evil than a person. Dreyfus thinks that we don't make decisions according to ironclad rules the way that computers do. We can model human behaviour using an algorithm, but being able to model something using an algorithm isn't the same as that thing actually being run by an algorithm. 
You can predict the weather using an algorithm, but the weather is not governed by an algorithm. Maybe our practical ethical decision making in an emergency, like a road traffic accident or a trolley problem, isn't actually consistent. We know that things like implicit bias exist, and that human decision making can be affected by all kinds of stuff, like what kind of mood you're in, and whether you had a cup of coffee this morning, and stuff that, philosophically speaking, shouldn't be relevant. Which means that if we try to find these principles in a simulation and teach them to a computer, we may not be able to find them. Or worse, we might find bad principles and hand them on. PBS Idea Channel have already done great work on how machines and algorithms can inherit bias, even racism from their human creators, because technology is created by us, and it reflects our ideas and values. Having reviewed the literature, I think there's a real risk of ethical complacency here. For instance, this article in IEEE Spectrum by Noah Goodall says, The ethics of road vehicle automation is a solvable problem. We know this because other fields have handled comparable risks and benefits in a safe and reasonable way. Donated organs are distributed to the sick based on metrics, based on quality-adjusted life years and disability-adjusted life years, among other variables. And the military draft has added exemptions for certain useful professions, such as farmer and teacher. And I don't know if I missed a memo or something, but last time I checked, the ethical issues surrounding disability, quality-adjusted life years, medical resources, and military conscription have definitely not been solved. I mean, I haven't checked Twitter since this morning, so maybe they have recently, but... The idea that we can just look at how other people tackle ethical issues and then apply them to this presumes that those other ethical issues have in fact been solved. It also assumes that ethical issues can, in fact, be solved, rather than just approached. In his book Click Here to Save Everything, the writer Evgeny Morozov cautions that technology and tech development conditions us to think about the world in terms of problems and solutions. Solutions, in the engineering sense, are unambiguous, they are specific to a well-defined given problem, you get the same output for every same input, and something either works or it isn't a solution. But some problems aren't like that, they can't be solved. They will always be ambiguous, context-dependent, to a degree relative, perhaps, and have pros and cons to every move that we might make, which might even cause us to reconsider how we visualize the problem. Crime is an excellent example. We won't ever solve crime. If we were to totally eliminate crime altogether, then that would be horrible. We'd have to be living in some sort of totalitarian society. And sometimes crime can be good, even morally necessary. Crime arises from very complex social conditions, some of which we want to keep. And so we can't really solve it, we can just approach it and weigh the pros and cons of our approaches. We're very used to technology and tech development being presented as solutions. And Morozov says that when all you've got is a big hammer, all your ethical problems start to look like nails. Part 3. Who the heck even rides trolleys? Trolley problems come up a lot, and there are a lot of articles that just do what I did in part one. Mention that they exist, explain them, and say they're relevant to self-driving cars. But are they? Are trolley problems even useful at all? One criticism of trolley problems is that all the possible outcomes are known. The trolley either kills five or it kills one, which is a scenario quite unlike actual moral decision-making, where we aren't always certain about what the consequences will be, and we have to take a best guess. Trolley problems also make moral decision-making out to be very individualistic, whereas in real life we might also want to ask questions about the conditions that shape our ethical dilemmas. In their article, The Trolley Problem Will Tell You Nothing Useful About Morality, Brianna Renix and Nathan Robinson write, We should spend far more time inquiring into the trolley company's lackadaisical attitude to safety precautions, and whether it's morally justified to cut down on voluntary brake inspections in order to decrease operating costs and maximise quarterly profits. Obviously that quote is a little bit facetious, but the point is, sometimes how we arrive in an ethical dilemma can be just as important as, if not more important than, the ethical dilemma itself. For instance, at time of filming, in this very city, the Autonomous Nation of Anarchist Libertarians, or ANAL for short, have taken over a £15 million mansion in Eaton Square. The mansion belongs to a Russian billionaire who owns, I think, four or five mansions in the UK, and it's been empty for months. They've taken it over and converted it into a homeless shelter. Technically illegal, but doing something nice for somebody else. 
Ooh, isn't it a philosophical dilemma? Philosophy class 101, write 500 words on this decision and put it on my desk on Monday morning. But hang on a minute, let's think about the background ethical conditions. You telling me there are empty houses and homeless people? Why? How do we get to that situation? Why do people become homeless in the first place? You see how the original question, like the trolley problem, takes the elements of the question as a given. And by focusing just on that individual decision, we can miss some of the richer issues that surround and create the question itself. In a similar vein, the trolley problem also presents a scenario in which doing the right thing, whatever you decide that is, doesn't cost you anything, materially. Whereas in real life, it might turn out that the right thing to do is the less profitable thing to do, at least some of the time. Concerns like this lead Renix and Robinson to say that this makes the trolley problem the perfect philosophy question for the neoliberal era, since it reduces everything to individual choice and tells us there is no alternative to existing power structures. So what are the background ethical issues of self-driving cars? Well, the ethics of the companies that make them, for one thing. Uber, for instance, has broken the law in California by illegally testing self-driving cars on public roads, according to the Attorney General. Uber's whole business model is to exploit loopholes in labour laws to dominate the transport market in major cities across the world, flooding them with underpaid, exploited drivers to smash the competition whilst dodging or just breaking existing regulations. When they've done that, they'll fire all of their drivers and replace them with self-driving cars to make all the money in the world. You know how Uber keeps trying to say, oh, our drivers aren't employees, they're independent contractors. Yeah, that's because if you were legally an employee, you would have some rights when they eventually replace you with a self-driving car, and they don't want that. They want you to build Uber into a global brand, but then keep all the profit you make them for themselves. Here's another important background ethical question. Let's say there's a human driver driving along, and a kid runs out into the road. The driver swerves to avoid hitting the kid, mounts the curb, and hits you. You're a pedestrian, just walking along, minding your own business, when BAM. If you want to, you can take that human driver to court. You might not win, but you can hold them accountable. You can require them to stand up in public and defend that decision. So let's imagine that instead of a human driver, it's now a self-driving car. If you think about it, it's the same scenario, except the decision to swerve and hit you was made months ago by some computer programmer who programmed the car to weigh risks and outcomes in that way. Remember, they're not really autonomous vehicles, they're just unsupervised. They're not really driverless, they're just pre-driven. Can you take the computer programmer to court, or the company that made the car? Because if you can't, then some software company has just been given the unaccountable power of life and death over you. Now that is a f***ing trolley problem. We've departed somewhat from trolley problems, so are they really useful? Well, useful for what? Useful for deciding what we should do? Arguably not. Useful as a realistic simulation of genuine ethical dilemmas? Uh, yeah, arguably not. Useful for revealing people's inner moral instincts? Yeah, maybe. Useful as a teaching tool for comparing various ethical theories and as a scaffold for introducing you to the ethics of self-driving cars? Definitely. And in the spirit of Evgeny Morozov, I'm not going to conclude by offering a solution. I'm just going to leave you to discuss your various approaches in the comments. Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube is what allows me to pay rent and make the show. Please take a minute to sign up and give whatever you can. Alternatively, PayPal.me slash PhilosophyTube is where generous folks can make one-time donations.